right, good evening. Welcome to our School of the Bible. We're on night seven, and so uh, we're counting them down, almost halfway through. Now, I do need to make an announcement, so if you're here in the building or you're listening online, I need you to pay attention here just real quick. The next two weeks, after this week, we're going to be meeting on Thursday for the next two weeks, okay? Uh, we have uh, we have a, a school board meeting next week, Pastor Mills and I on Tuesday, so we can't have it on Tuesday. And then the week following is our uh, mission conference, okay? And so we'll be moving it to Thursday. So School of the Bible for weeks 8 and 9, the next two weeks after tonight, will be uh, on Thursday for each of those weeks. That's on the 11th and the 18th, all right? So mark that on your calendars. If you show up here next Tuesday, it won't be nobody here, okay? All right, so uh, let's get our Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Romans. And we're going to, uh, we got kind of two things to cover tonight before we go into the book of Romans. We're going to do an introduction to the church epistles, or the epistles, not just the church epistles, but the introduction uh, to the epistles of the New Testament. And then we're going to talk about the book of Romans tonight. And so uh, we'll begin there. So if you found your place, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God for His help tonight. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank You for the night. Thank You for another opportunity to be in the house of God. And Lord, we thank You for those who have been able to come out on this beautiful day. And Father, we uh, thank You for those who are tuning in live stream. And so, Father, help us, Lord. Our goal is wherever we're at is to learn the Bible and teach the Bible. So, Father, help us to do that in both ways. And God, to learn more about You, that we might be closer to You, and that we might lead others to Christ. So help us now, we pray, in Jesus' name, and amen. Okay, for those of you who have the additional notes, those of you Maranatha Baptist Church people uh, who come to church here, you have the additional notes. I want you to look at your additional notes for introduction to the epistles. And we're going to look at a few of these. I can't get bogged down uh, too much here, but we're going to give you kind of an introduction uh, because uh, so far in uh, New Testament 1, we've looked at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then last week we studied the book of Acts, which is church history, the Acts of the Holy Spirit working in and through the apostles and the early church there. And so we studied the book of Acts, and now uh, we're going to kind of transition into these epistles from Romans uh, to Jude, okay? And so this semester, uh, I think we only get to Ephesians. I think our last class in here on the last night is in Ephesians. And then next semester, we'll pick up the book of Philippians. But the epistles go from Romans to Jude. Now, there's nine church epistles, and there's the pastoral epistles, and then there's the Jewish Christian epistles, okay? And so we're going to kind of go through that tonight. But get your additional notes out. And we're going to look at a few of these. Um, and look at your first page there. And I'm just going to kind of go down. I'll kind of tell you where I'm at. The first one there, and if you don't have the notes, just listen. I'll try to go a little bit slow. That's hard for me to do sometimes, but I'll try. There are 22 epistles, and they can be divided into three groups. And so these next few books of the Bible uh, that we're getting ready to look into, uh, uh, we're going to look at the epistles, okay? And they're going to be broken down. There's 22 of them left. And so we're going to look at these in three groups. The first group is the Christian church epistles. And that's going to be Romans to 2 Thessalonians. Romans to 2 Thessalonians, they're going to be written by the Apostle Paul. And then we have the pastoral epistles and uh, uh, giving instructions especially for the office of pastor. And those are the books of uh, 1 Timothy to Philemon. So 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are considered pastoral epistles and given instructions to Timothy and Titus uh, concerning uh, uh, the work of the church and the ministry and uh, guides for us today in the church. And then we have the Hebrew Christian epistles and uh, they were primarily written to Jewish Christians, but of course we know that all these scriptures were written uh, uh, for our learning, and so we learn from all of these. And so the Hebrew Christian epistles is Hebrews to Revelation, okay? So Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, Jude, and Revelation are considered the Jewish Christian epistles because they're writing primarily to this, these new converts, these new Jewish converts. Uh, they were Jews and now they're Christians, okay? And so they're writing to this group of people primarily. Now for you and I, the writings that deal specifically with us and in and, and the church age that we live in, uh, are the Christian church epistles. And Romans through Second Thessalonians, they're jam-packed with doctrine. They're, they're uh, things that you and I, as uh, uh, living in this church age today, that we need to be very intimately familiar with those epistles. You know, when we've been saying this the whole time, that not all the Bible's written to us, but it's all written for us, okay? Now, 
when we come to the church epistles, the church epistles are written to us, okay, as the churches, okay? Even though we can learn from all the other books of the Bibles, and even though they all had different target audiences who they was writing to, you know, we talked about the gospel records, and uh, Matthew wrote to the Jews, Mark to the Romans, Luke to the Greeks, and John uh, to, to everyone. But uh, we all learn from that. But these, uh, these church epistles are written directly to the church. They directly apply to the church, okay? And so let's look at some of this. Uh, let's drop down a few paragraphs there. Uh, let's look at uh, as an important foundation about middle way on the page. The gospels are important, but our church doctrine for the present dispensation is the Christian church epistles, as we said. The gospels should be emphasized, but they are primarily to the Jews and the kingdom, while the church epistles are to the church. Now remember... I'm not getting back into all this again tonight. But remember, Jesus came to what people group first? He said, I'm come only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, okay? So you have to understand a lot of the teachings that Jesus is talking about in Matthew and Mark, Luke and John, he's dealing with the kingdom. He's dealing with the nation of Israel, okay? They're looking for a king in their kingdom, okay? And so that's dealing with them, Okay, a lot of Matthew 24, Matthew 25, a lot of that has to do with the kingdom. So uh, even though we learn from those things, we can't really plug ourselves into all those places because, uh, you see, the, the kingdom was being offered to them during that time, but they rejected that. And now it was a mystery in the Old Testament, but the church, God's plan is where the dispensation we're in now, that the church age, and now the writings of these churches, and Paul would write many times, I think Paul said 13 times, uh, he talks about mysteries in the New Testament. And these are things that weren't previously known, not something spooky or mystical, but these are things that have been previously hid but are now revealed. And so Paul would receive directly a lot of this revelation that the other apostles didn't receive. And you read about that and a lot of that in Ephesians chapter 3. And so understanding that, these Christian church epistles really, truly apply to the church age, to you and I. And so uh, if you're looking for the writings in the Bible that's exactly to us, there they are. Now all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is written for us, okay? And there's learning in every verse and we can learn and study. But when it comes to who it was wrote to, when we get to Romans to 2 Thessalonians, they are written specifically to the church, okay? And here's where we find the church doctrine. You don't find church doctrine in the Old Testament because the church is a mystery in the Old Testament. But now, okay, making sense? Have I lost anybody yet, okay? All right, we're all on the same page, okay? Okay, with Israel's national rejection of the kingdom and their Messiah, remember they rejected it? When they crucified Jesus, they said, Away with him, we'll have no king but Caesar to reign over us. And so nationally, they're led by their leaders, the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin crowd. Led by that crowd, they nationally rejected Christ as their Messiah and their leader. And then after Stephen preaches his message, where we studied about this last week, in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, and, and he, he gives this big long discourse. The whole chapter number 7 is, 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 is Stephen preaching to those Jews there in Jerusalem. And what do they do? They stone him. Okay, and so now the kingdom is in abeyance. As we come into uh, uh, these uh, Christian church epistles and uh, these other ones, the kingdom is in abeyance. What we mean by that is that God's not through with Israel, but he set them aside as dealing with them nationally right now. In other words, when God first brought Israel out of Egypt, they were a theocracy. God was their leader. God was their king. God was their God. But remember, they wanted a king, and so they began to drift away from that. And now... Since Christ has come, they rejected him. Now the kingdom has been set to the side and pastors have been preaching about the millennial reign of Christ and Jesus coming back again. At that time, the kingdom will be restored. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to Revelations. But no, in, in between here, in Romans, uh, especially from Romans to 2 Thessalonians, we're dealing with the church, okay? All right, let's look on the next page here quickly. We've got to move on so we can get in the book of Romans tonight. About the third paragraph down on page 2, the nine church epistles are addressed to seven churches, okay? So if you break these down, uh, you got uh, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians, right? And so these are written to these group of churches. It's interesting that the Lord uh, Jesus Christ addresses seven churches in Revelations 2, chapters 2 through 3. So again, seven. Of course, in the Scripture, seven is the number of spiritual completion or perfection. 
And so the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Paul, would address seven churches, and we have, in complete form, the embodiment of full doctrine for the church age, okay? And so uh, just as Jesus addresses the seven churches of Revelation, which were actual seven churches, but they also represented seven different church ages. We don't have time to get in that tonight. But understand the number seven is important. The Holy Spirit doesn't put things in the Bible by accident. And so Paul writes these church epistles to seven churches, the number of spiritual perfection. So what does that mean to you and I as believers today? Well, from Romans to 2 Thessalonians, we have all the doctrine that we need to run the church and, and what we need to believe and stand on. It's all found. Especially tonight, we get in the book of Romans. It's the most jam-packed book of doctrine in the, in the Bible, okay? And so we're going to get to that. Now, if you look at some of these other ones, we don't have time to get into it all uh, tonight, but there's a lot of interesting uh, topics to look at here, and it breaks them down individually, what each one of them, uh, kind of their theme and the key words, and we'll, we'll get into them as they study. So I don't want to dwell much there tonight, but that's kind of an introduction. So know these next, from uh, Romans to 2 Thessalonians, we're going to be studying the church epistles, and then uh, from 1 Timothy to Philemon, we're going to study the pastoral epistles next semester, and then finish up with the Hebrew Christian epistles from Hebrews to Revelation. Okay, all right, clear as muddy water. All right, let's go to the book of Romans tonight in our notes and then in our, uh, our Bibles tonight, and we'll, uh, we'll finish here uh, for our lesson. Okay, the first slide. Look in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And so the book of Romans is God's salvation for sinners. And so we see Paul, he's the author, he's the human penman, he calls himself the servant of Jesus Christ. Remember, he was called to be an apostle. We'll get into some of this probably in the next couple of weeks, especially when he writes in the book of Corinthians, he's defending his apostleship. There's some that are doubting, you know, since he wasn't one of the original ones, and, and uh, they were doubting his authority, trying to cause trouble in the church, uh, just like some are trying to do today. And so Paul had to defend his apostleship. And so he was called to be an apostle. He was called out of due time. You read about that in 1 Corinthians 15. And even though he wasn't there with the original ones, but what was one of the qualifications we said in Acts to be an apostle? They had to see the resurrected Christ. They had to see Jesus. They had to be with him. Did Paul see Jesus? Yes, he made him win. Acts chapter 9, the road to Damascus. And so, and, and the Lord took him to the wilderness for three years there. He's in Arabia in the wilderness, and God gives him these revelations. And so he saw Christ. Remember on the ship uh, there before it uh, broke apart there in Acts 27, I believe it is, that, uh, uh, that the Lord was with him there. And so he was called to be an apostle. He was separated unto the gospel. You remember before Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was, uh, uh, he was a Roman citizen, but he was also a Jew. And uh, Paul said that he kept the law, and that's where he was going in Acts chapter 9 to persecute Christians. And uh, he thought he was doing God a favor, and he was a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And uh, he said of uh, the straightest sect. Uh, but see, God called him out of that and separated him and gave him specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, remember... The Lord would give Peter specifically the keys to the kingdom. That's dealing with Israel. Remember, Peter's the apostle to who? The Jewish people. And Paul's going to be the apostle to the Jew and Gentile, but primarily to the Gentile. But Paul is going to be committed to the gospel, and he writes about that in 1 Corinthians 15. And even though, you know, uh, Peter preaches, you know, about uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he's preaching primarily to the Jews, but the message that we call the gospel here, Paul brings it into full revelation. And so there were some things that, that Peter even said, talks about in the book of Peter, that uh, our brother Paul's told us some things that are hard to understand, you know. And so God gave him some certain revelations the others didn't have. And so Paul would know Jewish legalism, Greek culture, and Roman citizenship. Paul was a very educated man. The Bible said that he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, and he was a teacher uh, there in Israel. And so Paul was a very educated man. He's a very religious man. And so God called him out of that. And God saved him by his marvelous grace. The date of this writing of Romans is about A.D. 56. And it's written from Corinth and it's toward the end of Paul's third missionary journey. Okay, the next slide. The theme is righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. There's absolutely no way that we can study all of this. 
uh, in the book of Romans, uh, uh, part, part of my uh, paper that I've been writing for uh, Bible college, I, I, I'm writing from like Romans uh, chapter 3, like verse uh, 20 through 28, and I've got like, uh, I've probably got about 20 some pages of just expository going through those. It's so packed full of stuff. It's just so much there. But in 116 and 17, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Sorry, Calvinists, there's another Bible verse that says that salvation's for everyone. That's what my Bible says. Now, the Calvinists might have another Bible that says something different, but this Bible says that the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That's the key. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so what was God's plan? Who was the gospel to go to first? The Jews and then to the Greek, okay? Or the Gentile. Then look in verse 17. For therein... Speaking of the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Do you all remember last semester what book of the Bible we, we seen that the first time in? It's one of those hard to pronounce books of the Bible. It has a lot of K's in it. Habakkuk, all right, okay, and so the just shall live by his faith. And so here Paul quoting that, but now we find that righteousness... It's not through the law. It's not in keeping uh, the Judaism and keeping the works of the law, but righteousness. And see here in the book of Romans, we're drawing this out. Paul's explaining this, that salvation through the gospel, through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the only way that a man can be declared righteous is by faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And so he's the way of salvation. As a matter of fact, go over to chapter 3. And look in verse 19 and 20. And so from about verse, uh, well, I was telling you from about verse 19 to uh, 28, I, I was bogged down there with about 20 pages worth of stuff there. And verse 19, he says, Now we know that what uh, things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, but that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And so here's what Paul is pointing out in the book of Romans, that all of the world is guilty before God. He goes on this chapter and says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, and he says in Romans 5.12 that uh, we are all sinners. But look in verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, we don't have this teaching anywhere, but now that we come into the epistles. And so now Paul is explaining to us as well as to the Jews that righteousness doesn't come by keeping the law. It doesn't come through Judaism. It didn't come through Moses. Righteousness alone comes through faith in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, let's go and look at your notes here. Uh, uh, number one, the why of salvation. We find that in chapters 1 through 3. And so chapter 3, the chapter we just read, if you would continue to read on, a dynamic chapter of salvation. Uh, chapter 3, by the way, when uh, if I lead somebody to the Lord and they've never read the Bible much before, I always have them go to two books to start out in, John and Romans. John and Romans. And those of you who help us put those uh, uh, Bibles together that went uh, to these different places, remember we did that for Beacon of Truth? Uh, uh, they, they were what? John and Romans. Why? Because they're easiest to understand and they're the ones that apply to us, okay? And so that's why we do that. And so the why of salvation, why we need salvation, we find that in chapters 1 through 3. The answer is, do y'all have this? Because all men are condemned. Do y'all have that in your books? Okay, so why, do, why does man need salvation? Why can't we just keep the law? Why can't we just have good works? Well, because the Bible points out, Paul points out to us, the Holy Spirit shows us, especially here in the book of, book of Romans, that we are all condemned sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one, that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world become guilty before God. And so all of these verses point to the condemnation of us who are sinners in need of a Savior. Number two, the way of salvation, we find chapter 4. It gives the example of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works. And so if you read chapter 4, what you're going to find out is that God made the promise to Abraham before he gave Moses the law. There was no law under Abraham. The law didn't come till uh, they come out of the nation of Egypt and uh, God makes them a nation and brings them into the wilderness. And so Abraham, how, was that? how did Abraham get in? Well, 
by faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And so chapter 4 talks about that. Look in chapter 4 and verse number 20, talking about the way of salvation. It's not by works. It's not through the law. It's not through circumcision or uncircumcision. But look in verse 20, talking about Abraham. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded, boy, we need to be fully persuaded today. Uh, that, I, I'm about ready to preach a message right there. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. We need to be fully persuaded that God's going to get us through this. God's going to get us through coronavirus. God's going to get us through the political mess. God's going to get us through this corrupt world. We're heading to a country that's not here. We need to be fully persuaded. Verse 22, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now the word imputed here, it's one. Uh, and what I love about the book of Romans, and you'll find about every one of these words, and I call them, I, I've, I've taught a lot of them here on Wednesdays, and I, and I did a whole series of them when I was pastoring down in Summers County, but I call it the doctrine of salvation. And you have words like justification, redemption, sanctification, glorification, imputation, uh, and all these other words you find, and you'll find all of these words dealing with salvation, grace, faith, in the book of Romans, okay? So notice what he says here. And he says, therefore it was imputed to him. That means to put to your account. In other words, uh, if, if, if I would go, if I, if I had a million dollars, I'd go to Tom's bank account and I'd put it in Tom's bank account. That would be imputed to Tom, okay? But here's what Christ did for us. More, better than a million dollars, uh, Christ took our sin upon him and we receive his righteousness by faith through him. If we believe in him, then Christ has died and paid for the penalty of our sin. He took that upon him, and he imputed to us his righteousness. He put that to our account. So who got the better deal? We did. Look in verse number 23. Now it was not written for their sake alone that it was imputed to him. So this was not just for Abraham. This is what Paul is trying to write here. So this is where it applies to you and I. He said, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed, but for us also. And so when Paul uses the word us, he's including himself in the group. What group is Paul in? What group is Paul talking to? The church, the Christians, the believers, you and I, all right? And so, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So the way of salvation is by faith in Christ. And then we find the work of salvation uh, in, uh, in the book of Romans. Now, what time do we? Okay, let's look in Romans chapter 3. We, uh, so you find the why of salvation, the way of salvation, which is Christ. Why? Because we need to be saved. We're all sinners. The way is by Christ. And then the work of salvation and so what happened? See, the moment that you got saved, all you knew about, you was a sinner and you was on your way to hell and you needed a Savior and you called on the name of the Lord. You didn't understand what God was doing in your life. You didn't understand what all happened at that moment. But as we read the, the New Testament epistles, we understand that the moment that you received Christ, all you knew how to do, you, some of us didn't even know how to pray. We just cried out and said, Lord, save me. But you know what was happening? The moment you prayed that prayer, you were justified. The moment you prayed that prayer, you were sanctified. The moment that you prayed that prayer, you were reconciled back to God. The moment you prayed that prayer, you were forgiven. The moment you prayed that prayer, you were imputed the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The moment you uh, prayed that prayer, you were redeemed. And all of that, you didn't have no idea. But we learn about that as we study, especially the book of Romans. It's a wonderful book of the Bible. And so we find about justification, propitiation, and sanctification, all those words we can't pronounce, right? Uh, but they all have dynamic meanings, and they all have a part collectively in salvation. And, and so it's a blessing to study each one of those individually. Do a Bible study on each one of them. Just study justification. Study sanctification. Study propitiation. Study uh, 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 separation. Study rede uh, redemption. St uh, reconciliation. I mean, there's so many of them. I could give you a list later of all those. I have them somewhere. Uh, but I, I've preached messages on those. But it, it, they're wonderful doctrinal truths that you and I need to understand. Look in Romans chapter 3, verse... Uh, uh, and this is where I was going with my paper here. Uh, look in verse 21 through 25 or 26. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so what he's saying, the righteousness of God doesn't come by the law. He says, but look at verse 22, even the righteousness 
of God, which is by what? Faith. There's one of those vocabulary words of salvation. By faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Calvinists, don't read the book of Romans because you're going to be very disappointed because the Bible says that salvation by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. That's, that's very simple. I don't see how people get confused about that. All means all. When God say, uh, says, what he, uh, when says what he says, he means what he says, right? Look in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's the condemnation. But now look in verse 24. Notice these words. Being justified. That mean, that's a legal term. That means you've been declared righteous. Being justified by faith, or excuse me, being justified, I'm quoting Romans 5, being justified freely, didn't cost you anything, by His grace, there's another one of these Bible words, and then through the redemption, study redemption, I'm telling you there's a whole lot in the Bible about redemption from Genesis to Revelation. God's book of the Bible is a book of redemption. Okay? And so, uh, and so redemption that is in Christ, that means to set free by paying a cost. And then verse 25, whom God has set forth, that's Christ, to be a propitiation, that means that, appe that he was the only one that could appease God's angered holiness against sin. He was the satisfactory sacrifice for us through faith in his blood, talking about the blood of Jesus, to declare his righteousness, that's imputation, for the remission, that's forgiveness of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. I would love to just hunker down there and preach for the rest of the night. I can't. Uh, there's so much there. But notice just in those three or four verses how much doctrine, how much truth. That if, you would, if you would take the time, I promise it would take you days and weeks to just study those three or four verses individually, the words in them, and just go through the Bible and look it up and soak it up. And it's wonderful. I encourage you to do that. Next, uh, oh, never mind. Okay, we have the outline here. Uh, chapters 1 through 8 is primarily doctrinal chapters. Chapters 1 through 8, one of my favorite uh, chapters in all the Bibles, Romans chapter number 8. I love Romans chapter 8. I almost had it memorized one time, almost. And uh, doctrinal, and of course, uh, when, when I lost my hair, I lost my memory uh, capability, so I can't memorize verses like I used to. So chapters 1 through 8 is doctrinal. Uh, that's the primary uh, the theme that's being taught there. But when you come to chapters 9 through 11, it's national. It's dealing with Israel. Say, so out beside where it says national, write Israel. And so, uh, you know, uh, the Reformed theology says that God's finished with Israel that the church has replaced Israel. But that's false doctrine. They need to read Romans 9, 10, and 11. God is not finished with Israel. The only reason that we got in was because Israel. We don't need to be looking down at the Jewish people. We need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to be praying for them. There are still Jews being saved today. And so now in this church age, it's both Jews and Gentiles being saved in the body of Christ. There's no difference. God is no respecter of person. But understand this. The Bible talks about in Romans 9 through 11 that God will once again save a remnant in Israel. Out of the tribulation period, they're going to have to go through the tribulation period. Uh, we, we was teaching, uh, preaching to the teenagers last night, been going through Hebrews chapter 11. We talked about Enoch. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. He was translated prior to the flood. He's the great-grandfather of Noah. And so before the flood came, before judgment came, Enoch was a preacher of righteousness during his day, during his time, and he walked with God and God took him and he was not. He was translated. He's a picture or a type, and even though we know the teaching of the church not in the Old Testament, we can see it in the life of Enoch. Enoch left out before the judgment. He was translated. He didn't die. Now Noah, we're going to talk about Noah this week in teen church, but Noah is a type of Israel. Noah's saved, but he has to go through the judgment. And Israel will be saved. They will go through the tribulation. And Noah was a preacher in his day. The 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel are going to preach during that, that time of the tribulation. And, and the kingdom will be established at the end when they come through it on the other side. And so both were delivered. So not getting into all that. But nationally, God is not finished with Israel. He's parked them as a nation right now. And he will deal with them in another dispensation when the tribulation begins, okay? But now Jews or Gentiles alike can be saved in the church age, okay? And so then the last uh, several chapters from 12 to 16 are practical chapters, okay? They deal with practical things, practical truths, practical applications in our spiritual life. All right, let's look at some of these key words here. Next slide. 
The word faith is mentioned 39 times in the book of Romans. The word righteousness is also mentioned 39 times. The word grace is mentioned 24 times. By the way, Paul writes more about grace than any of the other New Testament writers. He's the apostle of grace. And so he writes about the grace of God because where God brought him from, he never forgot that. He knew it was only by God's grace. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that applies to you and I. Notice spirit. Spirit's mentioned 29 times. Right out beside that, Romans chapter number 8, the Holy Spirit's mentioned 19 times in that one chapter. So it's mentioned 29 times. He's mentioned 29 times in the book of Romans, but 19 of the 29 times is in chapter number 8 of the book of Romans. Wonderful chapter of the Bible. And then the word all for the Calvinist there is mentioned 54 times in the book of Romans. All, 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 all. All men of sin, all men need to be saved. And all men can be saved if they will put their faith and trust in Christ. God's made a way. Okay, the key verse, we already read those a while ago. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, next slide please. Special features in this book. We see a clear picture of the spiritual condition of Israel as a nation. Okay, uh, they were selected and chosen by God. That was passed. You read about that in chapter 9, verses 6 through 29. Then they rejected Christ unto the present church age. You read about that in chapter 9, 30 through chapter 10, 21. And then they will again be accepted again, as we talked about, in the future. And so... Chapters 11, 1 through 29. And so past they were chosen by God to be God's chosen people. They were selected and then of course in the present they rejected. So from the crucifixion even till now, not all the Jews reject Christ. There's many saved uh, Jews. But nationally, as, as, and as when we say this, we're not saying that every Jew disbelieves because there are some that believed, all right? And so the, the first church, you and I wouldn't be saved if it weren't for the Jewish Christians. Remember at Pentecost, they were all Jews out of every nation there. And through them, we have the gospel. So we need to be thankful for them, not put them down, not talk bad about them. You better be careful. You're on dangerous ground when you're talking about God's people. And even though God may not be dealing with them as a nation, God still says that he'll bless those that bless them and and curse them that curse them. So you better be very careful about what you say about the Jewish people. And then they will be accepted again in the future as a nationally, okay? God will once again deal with them. In this book, every main aspect of salvation is dealt with and it's clear and full scope. And so, uh, you know, we read the book, of, you know, I tell these new converts to read the book of John. It's easy to understand, to know what Christ did, what he said. You remember we said the book of John's uh, filled with the short syllable words and easy to understand. But the book of Romans really talks about the why of salvation, okay? Sometimes we know what we believe, but we need to know why we believe what we believe, okay? Okay, we know that we're saved, but we need to know what that means. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to be justified? And so when you begin to study those things, we learn the why of that, okay? And so that's the most important thing. Uh, Mr. Coleridge said this, it is the most profound piece of writing in existence, speaking of the book of Romans. This book has a strategic position in the New Testament. It is the uh, doctrinal interpretation of the gospel presented and declared in Matthew through Acts. And so in Matthew through Acts, we see Jesus here bringing redemption. He, he is the Redeemer coming to redeem. Okay, he's coming to redeem mankind. And so we see the historical proof and evidence of that. And then in the book of Acts, he gives that to the church. But now, Romans acts as the bridge to explain all of that. Why it was necessary that Christ come and, and what that means that Jesus died on the cross and uh, how he's our redeemer and how he's our savior and how he reconciled us back to God. We learn about this and Romans provides the perfect bridge between the rest of the New Testament and the gospel records, okay? And then this epistle was delivered by a woman by the name of Phoebe and you'll read about that in chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. Okay, the last slide and we're done. I'm out of the way tonight. Christ in the book. He is our righteousness. Look in chapter 10, verse 3. Chapter 10, verse 3. 
Now, Paul's talking about the Jewish people. He says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and remember Paul was a Jew, and going about to establish their own righteousness, that was through the law, having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. He's talking about those still trying to keep the law instead of trusting Christ. Look in verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Christ is the end of the law. The law was never intended to bring salvation. The law was a schoolmaster, Paul says in Galatians, to bring us to Christ. But we read about it in Romans 3 that by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was given to show us God's holiness and our sinfulness. The law was given to show us we needed a Savior, that we couldn't get to God by ourselves. We can't keep the law. James said if we break the law at one point, we're guilty of all. And so we can't be saved through the law. But let me ask you this. Did Jesus do away with the law? No, he fulfilled the law. Every jot and tittle of the law was fulfilled in Christ for you and I. He didn't push it under the rug. He didn't do away with it. He just didn't say, well, you just do the best you can and do whatever you want to and we'll save you. No, Jesus fulfilled the law and the wrath of God. He took the penalty of sin because in the matter of salvation, sin, God cannot overlook sin. Sin had to be dealt with and Jesus did that. And so we read about that and then uh, you can read about that some more in Jeremiah 23, 6. And then he is the propitiation for our sins. We read those verses. We're not going to reread that. In chapter 3, verse 24 through 25, the word propitiation means to satisfy or to appease and uh, one of the best verses to understand that is Isaiah 53, 10, and 11, that the Bible said that it pleased the Lord to bruise him and that God was satisfied. When he shall see the travail of his soul, he shall be satisfied. And so that, that's the propitiation, Christ. The only thing that would, uh, could propitiate man's sin was the blood of Jesus Christ. The only thing that could satisfy... In other words, before... I'm getting deeper and I want to get... But before God, as a righteous judge, can... De- declare you justified, or that means not guilty, before God can declare you not guilty, the law had to be carried out. He couldn't bypass the law. The Lord, as much as He loved man, He couldn't overlook the law and say, okay, I love you, I'm just going to save you despite the law. No, the law had to be fulfilled. That's why Jesus came. And the sentence of the law, when man sinned, death came by sin. Death, the Bible said all souls that sin shall die. The Lord told them the Garden of Eden, the day that you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. And so there had to be death to satisfy the demands of the law. And when the blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat, it showed that the innocent had died for the guilty, that the sentence of the law had been carried out. And it was then and only then that the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat that God in His mercy could declare us righteous. That God who loved us the whole time, when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't quit loving them, But God couldn't forgive them unless the innocent died for the guilty. That's why he clothed them with the skins of that lamb, which is the first picture of Christ in the Old Testament. And so all the way through that, so uh, it's what what, what he's talking about here. And so Jesus died. He was a propitiation for our sin. And then he's the stumbling stone and the rock of offense. Look in chapter 9, verse 32 and 33, and we'll be finished for New Testament tonight. Chapter 9, verse 32 and 33 Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, talking about the Jews, but as it were by the works of the law, so they were trying to save themselves through the law, not by faith, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. That's Christ. In verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And so when Jesus was presented to the Jewish people, they stumbled over him. Instead of receiving him as their Savior, he came to his own, and his own received him not. He was the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, which was prophesied in the Old Testament. So the book of Romans, we don't have time to preach it all tonight, study it all tonight, but a book of church doctrine. I would encourage you to read it, study it, apply it to your life. Okay, we're going to take about a five-minute break, and then Pastor Mills will be here with the Christian home for tonight.
Okay, well, welcome back to School of the Bible tonight, and uh, it is the uh, Christian home, and uh, we've been dealing with a lot of things that uh, pertains to our Christian home in this class this semester, and tonight we are going to discuss the head of the household, and that is the father, the dad, the man. Uh, God gave uh, them a great responsibility and uh, in the home, and that is to lead the home according to the Bible, the ways of the Bible, to be the Christian leader in the home. So tonight's lesson is entitled, Fathers, the Glory of Children. And the, uh, the verse tonight is Proverbs 17 and verse number 6. And we're going to read that sort of as the theme verse tonight. And we'll look at some other scripture here in just a moment. But Proverbs 17 and verse number 6 the first part of that says children's children. Now that would be what? Grandchildren. Children's children are the crown of old men. But notice this next statement. And the glory of children are their fathers. So Solomon's saying here that one of the things that the children should be able to take pride in or find glory in is their father. They should be able to find an example. They should be able to find glory in their father. I noticed in your workbook there was a statement made here, and I just want to read it. It says, General Douglas MacArthur, a true and rare hero, said repeatedly that his greatest accomplishments in life did not occur on the battlefield, but in his home as he was able to be a truly Christian father to his children. Now, what a statement that is, you see. His greatest accomplishments wasn't the battles that he won, and, the, and how he fought on the battlefield, but it's what he accomplished in his own home. If ever there's a time that we need godly example in the home, it is the day in which we live. Because our nation, our country is trying to erase the godly example, and they want to fill the home with ungodliness and filth. And so it's high time that we men of God step up and be the godly example in the home that we, God has intended for us to read. And there's no mistake, as you read the Bible, you will discover that God places tremendous emphasis on the home. Uh, you can find it all through the scripture, and we've looked at many of it ourselves. He puts tremendous emphasis on the home. Matter of fact, I read where the word mother appears more than 360 times uh, in the Bible. However, the word father uh, uh, is mentioned over 1,300 times. Uh, in the Bible. So God has a message for the fathers. God has a message for the men tonight to be uh, the spiritual leader in your household. The glory of children are their fathers. And if you were asked this question, what example are you leaving your children? How would we answer that question tonight? If they were to follow our footsteps, where would it lead them? If they were to do what we do, where would it take them? You see, those are variable questions tonight that we fathers should uh, all the time ask ourselves. You see, fathers should be Christians. Uh, you can't be, a, you can't be a, a good example to your children and not be a godly father and not be a Christian. You see, every child should know that his daddy or his father uh, has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. It ought to show up in our life. It ought to show up in what we do. Uh, places we go, things we say, how we conduct ourselves. Fathers should, be, uh, should have Bible-based convictions. In other words, we shouldn't be ashamed to stand on what the Bible says. We shouldn't be ashamed to stand up, uh, in, especially in the day we live in. My goodness, there's a lot of things you can stand up for that uh, our world today is so quickly trying to tear it down. And, and, and you have to be living in a box if you can't see that our world's trying to tear down the God-given family, mom and dad and children. Uh, they're wanting to accept anything and everything. And there's no godly example. Uh, there's no godly leadership. Uh, there's no reference to the Bible. There's no love for the church. Uh, and, and dad, that's your fault. Amen. That's dad's fault. Uh, one thing dad ought to be is faithful uh, to the house of God, faithful to the word of God. And I do believe this from the scripture that dad, you're going to be the one that's held responsible uh, for these things. 
one of these days before God. So fathers should have a Bible-based convictions. What we believe, what we stand on should be according to this word of God. We need to be courageous and we need to speak freely and more often of the things of God. The one of the problems we have today in our homes is dad's being too quiet and uh, he needs to speak often and freely of the things of God from God's word. Uh, and then fathers should live clean lives. Children should never find uh, that daddy is doing anything that makes them ashamed to say that's my daddy, you see. And we, we are to live our lives. Our family is not ashamed of us. And so we have a huge responsibility. One of the greatest examples, I believe, of a father that failed in the Bible is if, you, if you'll turn over with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 4. And, we, and we, we're not going to read all this scripture. You have to read a whole lot of scripture here to understand what's going on. But the priest here is Eli. And uh, Eli failed to... Uh, to lead his home in the right direction. He's the, he's the priest here. But however, his two sons, Hopni and Phineas, uh, they, go, uh, they go the wrong way. They disobey God and they don't fulfill the work as God should have told them. And it all bounced back to uh, leadership within the home. He failed to be the leader that he should have been in his home. And then uh, as you read on, if you would go and read... Uh, the chapters prior to chapter four, uh, you would find uh, the the battle. The battle comes and the, against the Philistines, and and uh, make a long story short, Hopni and Phineas are killed, and the ark of God is taken. You see, it all went back to poor leadership in the home. Not putting your foot down, not setting some rules, not saying this is how you've got to do. This is the right way to do things and not being an example of doing the right thing. And then if, if you read here, I'm going, to, I'm going to read the last few verses of that chapter. But if you read chapter four, you'll find where Hopna and Phineas die in the battle and they come to the Eli and they'll tell him uh, what has happened. Uh, to his sons and he's old and he's feeble and the Bible says when he gets the news that, that the, his two sons have died and the ark has been taken that he falls backwards remember and he dies there now here's the verses I want us to pay attention to begin in verse 19 it says and his daughter-in-law Phineas' wife was with child near to be delivered and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. A sad ending here to a family which went all the way back to the leadership of a father. And you see, if we're not careful as men of God today and as fathers in our house, uh, we can... We'll either leave a good example or we'll either, either leave a bad example for our children to follow. And whether you believe it or not, children often will follow in your footsteps uh, and uh, we will take on the traits you take on. We'll like the things you like, agree with the things you agree with. We'll often do the things that you do. Okay, in your textbook tonight, in your book, we have three, three uh, basic topics here we want to look at under this uh, thought tonight. And the first one is children glory in the leadership of their fathers. Going back to what I said, the leadership, they pay attention to what you're doing. They pay attention to how you're leading things and what you're saying. You see, God has called the father to be the leader of the home. And mother, what's your job? That doesn't mean you don't have a job. We'll get into mama next time, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, what is mom's job? Well, mom is to be an encouragement to that father as he leads the father in the way that God would have him to lead. The mother is to be the uh, encourager, 
and the per, most time the prayer warrior. And of course, we'll, we'll get into some other things for the women, I think next week. But anyway, dad, you are to be the leader in the home. Uh, at the end of, of Joshua's life, there's a statement, and, and, and by the way, uh, Joshua chapter 24, most of you probably know this, uh, but in Joshua chapter 24, let's just turn right back there, uh, we're already, if you're still in Samuel, in Joshua chapter 24, uh, Joshua makes this statement, and it's, it's a great picture of leadership here, but uh, near the end of his life, uh, in Joshua 24 and verse 15, the Bible says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom ye will serve, uh, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye did dwell. But now here's this statement. But as for me, and what? My house. Now who does that entail? That entails everybody in the house. That entails the children, those that brought up. You see, as for me and my house, we, what's the next word? Will. Will. This word will gives a, it's a no choice situation, isn't it? And as far as our house goes, we will serve the Lord. He led his family in following God. He set the spiritual example. He was the spiritual leader in the home. And uh, the family followed the spiritual leader. Now, if, if, you, if you're going to refuse to go to church, you're going to refuse to live for God, then your family's going to refuse to go most of the time. Now, I say there's been times when mom comes without dad. I've seen that myself. And dad, you ought to be ashamed of that. Mom shouldn't have to come to church without you. Uh, you ought to be bringing that, those children uh, and your family and your wife to the house of God. Turn with me back to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, we have dealt with these scriptures before. Uh, but in Ephesians chapter number 5 and about verse 21, uh, let's look here. Uh, verse 22, let's do, let's do 21 and 22 down through uh, 25. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. That means to be an encourager, to be a helper. That's not a slave word. That's a helper word. To help your husband to right and faithfully lead your family in the spiritual way. And verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. And, and dad, our responsibility is to love our wives and our family. Part of that love is being the proper leader that God has called you to be. We should not, what we, we, we should not pretend to be perfect and know it all because I guarantee you we're not. Uh, we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers, but we, we, we seek them and we get God's help and God will help us. But our family should recognize that our desire is to lead them in the right way. Uh, our children should be able to glory in our leadership. And uh, uh, they should know what we believe, what we stand for, what's going to happen, and what we're not going to agree with. One of the greatest testimony is when your children are away from home and, and somebody wants something or going to do something, their children say, oh, but I don't think Dad would be pleased with that. Amen. You see, you've set a godly example. I, I can't help but think here uh, about uh, Noah. You, know, you ever think about Noah and his sons? And you know how Noah spent all that time building uh, the ark and, and the folks around him making fun of him and, and there'd never been no rain upon the earth and, uh, and Noah kept preaching and kept building and kept preaching and kept building. And you know them boys was right there with him. His family was there. Matter of fact, he'll bring his family. He'll lead his family into uh, the ark when it's all done. But, but they've seen all those years of building and all those years of ridicule. And you know, if they were ridiculing daddy, they were ridiculing the sons. And so they would, I, I often wonder if they didn't pull the sons apart and say, listen, your old man's crazy. You know, you know, your old man building, a, what is that he's building? You know, he's crazy. Preaching this about a flood and ain't never been no rain. But you know what? I believe them boys might have answered 
They might have said, well, I don't know anything about that. But one thing I do know is I know my daddy. And I trust my daddy. And my daddy trusts God. So that's good enough for us. You see, that's the leadership that our world needs today. You see, not wishy-washy and, and uh, believe in everything that floats along and flo floats our way. Let's believe the Bible and let's stand on the Bible and let's lead our family in the biblical way. The children need to glory in the leadership of their father. Number two, children need to glory in the love of their father. Now, sometimes love requires tough love. You ever, was you ever subject to tough love? No, as boys growing up, we had some moments of tough love. We didn't look at it as love, but come to find out it was. It kept us out of trouble. It kept us on the right path. And sometimes love is, I mean, love needs to be tender and it needs to be kind. That's the way God's love is for us. But can I tell you, God also has tough love. He has chastisement for us. If we get out, get out of sync, if we get out of the way, get out of the will of God, we can expect the chastening hand of God. Uh, and so it is part of love. Love is committed. Love is tender. Uh, love sometimes is tenacious. Love sometimes is tough. But, uh, but love is always necessary. You see, uh, I think about the Lord Jesus Christ upon this earth and how he was tender and compassionate to those that he met. Uh, but he could get riled up if he needed to, you know, when they were des when they're desecrating the temple. And, and you see, uh, uh, he was, uh, one thing Christ was, he, he was always approachable and always held the children. You know, when you sell Christ with children, how he dealt with those children, you see. And that's the kind of love we need to have for our children and our families. You know, tough love is needed sometimes, but not all the time. And... Uh, Children need to see love, love in their lives. You know, we meet a lot of children sometimes and they don't have much love in their life. And uh, they're seeking love. And by the way, if a child don't have love at home, they'll seek it somewhere else. And they'll, and they'll find it somewhere else. But it may not be what they need to find. They need to find it in their father uh, and in their home. Uh, and by the way, if, if most men are like me, uh, then we, we have to work on being more expressive of our love. You know, we get this tough man attitude. You know, I'm, t I'm, I'm a t tough man and I'm not weak. Well, by the way, loving is not weakness. Uh, loving is godliness. And so that's what we need to do. Fathers should love their children and should set a, a goal early in the child's lives to see them grow and to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and to see them saved. And, and that's going to come about by tenderness and by love and kindness, patience. Uh, if you're like me, you can learn a little patience along the way as well. And uh, aren't you glad God's loving and kind? Aren't you glad God is patient? And he is our example as fathers today as how we should love our own children. And I guarantee you, if you get into something you shouldn't, you shouldn't get into, you're going to have punishment coming. Uh, just like we did when we were children. And uh, uh, we get in trouble, we can expect to be in trouble. Uh, the goal should be expressed foremost uh, by a loving father and a praying father, praying for the children. So that children should see the leadership in their father. They should see the love in their father. And finally, children should glory in the loyalty of their father. The father should be loyal to several, th several things. Number one, he should be loyal to God. He should be loyal to Christ. He should be loyal to, the, to his local church. They ought to see dad bringing the kids to Sunday school. They ought to see dad sitting in church with them. They ought to see dad loading them up and bringing them back to Sunday night service. You see, that's our job, dad. And uh, uh, they should see you being loyal to the, because th they're going to be just about as loyal as dad's going to be. You see, I remember as a child, you know, we, you know when you were teenagers growing up, uh, you know, there was other things you wanted to do. Uh, Sunday would roll around and, you know, some of your buddies had a fishing trip or some of your buddies had, uh, were going out camping for the weekend. And you know what my dad would say? No, no, you're not Sunday. Sunday we're going to church. And, uh, and that was not a negotiable rule, you see. 
Uh, you can go for Saturday, or you can go Friday, or you, or you can go, but not Sunday. Why? That's the Lord's day, and we're going to be found in the house of God. They need to be loyal to Christ, and, uh, and, and if, if the children believe their father loved Jesus first and foremost, they're going to glory in that. They're going to see that, and a lot of times carry that on. Uh, they should be able to say, my daddy is a spiritual man. Or I know what my daddy would do. That's what God said of Abraham, wasn't it? I know what he'll do. I know what he's going to do. And uh, he, he will do what is right because he loves the Lord, you see. And then fathers must be loyal to their wives. You know, nothing sets a terrible example, men, to your children than you to be unfaithful to your wife. And your children's going to see that. It's going to affect your children's life. It's going to affect them and what they think and maybe even how they act in the future. And they only need to be faithful to our children, faithful to help them, see them through, punish them. You know, punishment's not a sin, by the way. Abuse is a sin, but punishment's not. You see, and punishment is needed. Uh, spare the rod. What's the Bible say? Spare the rod and spoil the child, ain't it? And... Uh, and so we, we have to uh, be a disciplinarian sometimes uh, to lead children in, in the right way. But we can love them. Uh, there, there's a, you know, our world, men, our world is full of temptation. Matter of fact, we talked about that last week when we talked about adultery and how it just messes the entire family up. How it'll, it'll just mess the whole family up. And if you remember in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 26, it said that adultery would bring a man to a piece of bread. You remember that? He would lose everything he had. It won't be worth what it'll cost uh, to be involved in a, uh, a, a moment of pleasure. Uh, uh, and you'll lose the, the trust of your family and you'll lose the, uh, the trust of your friends and, uh, and children, children will not be able to glory in that. Children need to be able to glory, glory in the loyalty of their father, faithful uh, father to them. Uh, and then finally, Dad, you need to be loyal to uh, to the house of God. Not only to Christ, but to your local church. You know, if we're going to have a generation coming up that's going to support the church, it's going to start in the example of mom and dad. You see. And if, if, if dad, if you don't think any, anything of the church, don't expect your children to. You see, loyalty, loyalty is more than attendance. I mean, it's important that you come. But, you know, attendance is just part of it. There's the giving aspect. There's the helping aspect. Uh, there's the attitude toward it. What's your attitude about church? Uh, you know, uh, if you get in the car on Sunday morning, you come to church, and all you can say is, boy, I hope the preacher is not long-winded today. Amen. Oh, boy, I could sure be somewhere else. I wish I was somewhere else. Well, you know who's listening? Them little kids in the back. And they say, well, Dad must not think too much of church. Amen. Uh, you know. Or you can talk about the preacher, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, what about that, Joseph? Amen. Yeah. Anyway, uh, be loyal to your church. Be loyal to your pastor. Be a faithful church worker. Be faithful in giving. Be faithful in your conversation. Determine to be a father who is loyal to Christ, to his family, to his church, and bring up them ch children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. They'll never forget it, right? Proverbs twenty-two and six, ain't it? Train up a child in the way that should go. When he is old, what? It will not depart from him, right? You see, it's our responsibility. I thank God for parents that made us do what we didn't want to. And now we look back up on it and we think, my goodness, what a blessing that was. And today, uh, you know, I, we can't control the way our children go, but we can set a godly example for them, uh, for them to follow that they will not forget. So fathers, the glory of the children is their fathers. What's your child seeing in you today? And what example are you leaving? Let's be godly fathers, determined to have a godly, good Christian home. God bless you and thank you. And Pastor Mays will be back just in a moment.
All right, we're back. We're back for our class, our last class, so we can get you guys out of here teaching of the Bible. And so we're going to be on Lesson 7 tonight. And our topic is teaching around a central theme, okay? So remember last week we talked about asking questions and, and so uh, using the questions. But tonight we're going to talk about teaching a central theme. Of course, this is kind of common sense, and we're going over uh, some things that I, 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 we all ought to just kind of uh, just know, and, uh, but sometimes maybe we take it for granted. But one of the most common complaints about Bible lessons and sermons is they're too long, no, is that, that they contain, <laughs> that's not in your book, is that they contain too many different ideas. Going two different, uh, too many different directions, like me. Uh, a good example is me. When I try to teach, I get off on 25 bunny trails and try to chase them, okay? But uh, I don't, you're not supposed to do that. So maybe some of y'all have wrote in and complained about uh, this. Maybe this is against me. And, but trying to get too many different ideas, okay? And so the key, whatever your lesson is, we want to take that one theme, that one truth, and we can build around that, and we can... Uh, you know, uh, go around the barn, as they say, to get to it, uh, but make sure that at the end of the day, at the end of the lesson, uh, you've projected that thought. The key thought, uh, one of the things we learned in uh, Bible college about uh, building sermons and, and uh, writing outlines is before you, before you preach a sermon, before you write your outline, write down your statement. Write down, you know, what thought. Okay, I'm going to preach out of Psalms 23, but what, what, what's the thought? What truth am I trying to convey and what, what main idea? And you should use that in your introduction and your closing and try to bring it all together in between. And so, and so that's your central thought, your idea. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's, let's talk about shepherds and the shepherd's relationship to the sheep and then build your message on that or your lesson. Okay, and so while we certainly want to teach students all that we can that's helpful and useful. We cannot effectively do unless we unite these truths together in a central theme. And so uh, we can get into this uh, dangerous, and I've been there. Uh, you give people too much information, okay? Uh, and it's not that you can give people too much of the Bible, but you've got to understand the Bible says for us, is, uh, this sunk into me uh, uh, after I started pastoring and preaching a little while, a verse that kind of came to my uh uh, mind uh, when I first started preaching and stuff, you know, I, I was worried about what all the other preachers thought about me and and if my sermon sounded right, if I had enough points in my outline, and, and I got over that real quick. But God convicted me, and there's a verse in the Bible that Peter says that we're to feed the flock of God. And so, just as you're, you're you, you would feed, we talked about uh, children and stuff. You know, uh, sometimes you got to understand in your gl uh, group or your class, people are on different levels, and so you got to spoon feed some. And some's ready for steak, and some's still eating uh, uh, applesauce, okay? And so you got to be able to feed. And so uh, do that to your audience, but feed them something. Uh, make sure they come away with something. That's my goal every time I try to teach or preach, and I ask God to help me do that, to convey the truth, to be an influence, and then to leave them the something they'll remember, to feed them something, something that will help them. Okay, not to impress them at my great uh, preaching abilities, which obviously I don't have, and teaching abilities, but to share truth. And that's what God uses us as pastors and teachers and leaders and parents as uh, conveyors of truth, okay? And so keep your central theme central, okay? And so we find this same pattern in the Bible. Now, under Roman numeral 1, uh, notice you have some blanks there. And notice you have some chapters of Scripture there beside it. Well, guess what your homework is for next week, all right, okay? So in this class, you've got homework, okay? And so what you're going to do is you're going to read these passages of Scripture, consider these examples, and write the theme of each passage. In other words, consider, look at each one, of, they're not very long, just look at each one of these passages and, and, and just pretend, you say, well, I don't teach Sunday school, I don't teach kids. Well, I want you for next week to pretend that you're going to teach these uh, to a Sunday school class, okay? And so you're going to get ready, and, and all you have to do, you don't have to come up with an outline, you're not going to teach, you're not going to speak, you just have to come up with a theme. And see what theme, as you read these verses of Scripture, what do you think the theme is? There's no right and wrong answer, and, and so uh, what, what, what you, the idea you get behind it, okay? And then we'll discuss them next week. Now, I'm going to give you one tonight, okay? Let's go to John chapter 4. Let's do one together. So I'll show you how easy it is. If I can do it, anybody can do it. So let's go and let's read John 4. It's your second one. So John 4, verses 34 through 38. John 4, 34 through 38. 
Now, as we're reading this, I want you to be thinking, and those of you listening to the live stream, maybe you don't have a book, we're reading John uh, 4, verses 34 through 38, talking about teaching the Bible. Uh, read along with us, and as we're reading, I want you in your mind to begin to think, what is the theme? What, what's the main idea of this passage, this particular portion of Scripture that we're looking at? What do you think the main idea is? So let's read it. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that reapeth and gathereth, or receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto a life eternal, that both he that soweth and that he that reapeth might rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, and whereon ye bestow no labor, and other men labored, and ye are not entered into their labors. All right, let's do a little bit of Bible study here just for a minute. Okay, before we jump into this theme, before we come pulling a theme out of here, you've got some thoughts hopefully in your head. This is John chapter number 4, okay? How, what do we know about John chapter 4? What's going on in John chapter number 4? What is the background? We're talking about studying the Bible, teaching the Bible. Well, who's Jesus been dealing with primarily the whole part of chapter 4. Now in these last verses, he's talking to his disciples, but really all of these other verses in this chapter, he's dealing with the woman at the well, okay? And so in Samaria, and remember uh, Jesus, uh, uh, his disciples come to him, and now this is the conversation. Jesus says, just uh, won this woman to himself, okay? He's told her about the water of life, and she goes, and, and she brings the whole city back, and uh, half of them are saved. And so, and so on that context, what do you think the theme of these verses we read are tonight? Somebody just blurt it out. What do you think? Just an idea that the verses we read, 34 through 38. Jesus, now Jesus has, has already won this woman to the Lord. His disciples come back. They don't know what's going on. And so Jesus is teaching them a lesson about what just happened. They're all reaping and sowing. And, and what do we refer to that to many times? Uh, uh, what, what else do we call that? And uh, what do we do as Christians when we reap and sow? We go sow what? Soul winning, Okay. And so, uh, and so there's no right or wrong answer. But uh, uh, to me, Jesus is talking about soul winning. You remember the disciples come back and, uh, and, 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 and they, uh, Jesus hadn't eaten, but he said, my meat's to do the will of him that sent me. And so Jesus' main focus was winning souls to himself, winning souls to Christ. And so he's given him that great lesson on sowing and reaping about the harvest field. And so that would be the theme and the idea. And so if we was going to teach around that, we would use Jesus' as example. We could go different ways. We could go back into John chapter 4 and notice all the things that Jesus did. He went out of his way. He went into Samaria. He talked to this Samaritan woman who the Jews have no dealings with. Uh, Jesus uh, confronted her. And so we could go that way. Or you could talk about a lesson where we're talking about sowing and reaping. The Bible talks about uh, winning souls. It's like planting and reaping and harvesting and, and go that direction. So see, but the main idea is soul winning. So I want you to do that. And for those of you who may not have a book, the other passages that they're going to have to do, and you can do this at home, is John 3, verses 3 through 21. John 3, verses 3 through 21. And we've already looked at John 4. Then John chapter 5, verses 17 through 47. John 5, 17 through 47. John 6, 6, or excuse me, John 6, 30 through 58. John 6, 30 through 58. Acts 8, verses 30 through 35. Acts 8, 30 through 35. And again, you just read them and you jot down a theme. No right or wrong. You're not going to fail. We're not going to kick you out of school of the Bible, okay? And so uh, you won't get a demerit or anything, okay? But just do your homework and uh, let's see what you can think of probing you, okay? And we'll check those next week, all right? And so we give you the homework at the first of the lesson. We haven't even taught the lesson yet, right? And so uh, we're giving you the homework at first. I didn't write the book, okay? Number two. We should follow this pattern in our Bible teaching. Looking Now, the, the, the topic tonight, what we're focusing on tonight is when we're teaching to come to a central theme, to build our lesson, to impart truth, and when our, uh, uh, our, our students leave at the end of the night or the day, whenever you're teaching, uh, they, they should know or have an idea of this theme. That's what tonight's lesson's about. We should follow this pattern in our Bible teaching. A, the benefits of teaching around a central theme, and here's some blanks for you. 
Number one, it gives unity to the lesson. There's your blank, unity. Number one, it gives unity to the lesson. Without a central theme, most lessons become scattered. And so we don't just wait, okay? You're going to teach Sunday school next week. We don't wait till Sunday morning. Uh, at, at five minutes before uh, while we're doing attendance and open the Bible and say, well, I think we're just going to teach out of John 5 today. We don't do that, okay? You need to have a central theme, have an idea, build around that idea. It gives unity to the lesson. It keeps you on focus. That's why I keep notes because I, I, I'm prone, uh, as the hymn says, I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. So when I'm preaching, I'm prone to wander away from my notes. And so my notes bring me back to this is what I studied all week. This is what theme that I'm trying to project. And so I, I got to come back to course, okay? And so it gives unity to your lesson. Number two, it enables the lesson to have a deeper impact. Number two, it enables the lesson to have a deeper impact. Effective teaching is like shooting a bullet, not buckshot, okay? And so a bullet's a tiny thing. You have to aim, uh, uh, just like in the movie, aim small, miss small. You have to aim. Uh, you have to aim. You want to hit something with a, a specific with a bullet, okay? Buckshot's just going to get anything in its path. That's not how we should teach, okay? Uh, you know, uh, you know, we don't come to the, the pulpit and, uh, okay, let, let's talk about doctrine tonight. We're going to talk about, and, and tonight in the next 15 minutes, we're going to discuss redemption. We're going to discuss sanctification, justification, propitiation in the next 15 minutes, just like I tried to do while I go to the New Testament, all right? But uh, that's shotgun approach, okay? Let's pick one, and, we'll, and that's, a, that's a lot of times while we as pastors... Um, uh, do series. It's not because we're lazy and it just gives us something to do, uh, but, but because we're trying to project a theme. And, 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 and you get into these topics in the Bible that are so big, you have to do it like that. You have to break it up and, 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 and break it in chunks. And so do that, okay? It gives a deeper impact. Number three, it aids the teacher in organizing his thoughts. It aids the teacher in organizing his or her thoughts, Okay? So again, if you are teaching a class, I recommend uh, 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 writing your theme down. What, okay, this is the lesson. Okay, you got all, uh, all these verses to read, but what's the main thought? You know, and a lot of times in some of these Sunday school uh, uh, li uh, literature, and sometimes you get sometimes, I I've seen a lot of these kids' uh, uh, Sunday school programs that uh, give to some of the teachers and stuff. I mean, they got chapters of the Bible they want you to read, and there's no way that you're going to talk to third graders or fourth graders and read one chapter, much less three chapters in the Bible. So you have to, as the teacher, read all that and then pull and extract something that you can give to them, okay? And so uh, you're pulling that central theme out. So all teacher uh, aids the teacher in organizing his or her thoughts. When a central theme is stated, one can easily discern the things that are major from the things that are minor, okay? So... Again, repeat that, and, all, and through your message, through your lesson, repeat that, that thought, that theme, that idea. Get that point across. Mention it over and over. Repeat. Go back and repeat things you've already said about, uh, about that theme to get to drive it home. You know, I'll tell the kids this, this sometimes, and I know kids don't pay attention half the time. I know that. I've, I've been around long enough, and most of it goes over their head, but they do learn stuff. And, 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 and I'm pleased with some of our young people now. Uh, we've had several. They're taking notes. They take notes. And we've had several over the years do that. But I've got a group coming up now, kind of a new group, fresh group of teenagers. And some of them I'm seeing starting to take notes. And I'm hoping it's contagious. But when you're doing that, they can follow your outline. Give them an outline. Be, clean, be plain. Be clear. And then go back and quiz them on the next week. And, and most of the time, if they write it down, they'll remember that. Okay? And so bring them back to that theme. Okay? And then uh, number four, it helps the students to easily learn one unmistakable truth, okay? I'll tell them this all the time. If you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, this is what I've been trying to... Uh, for the last 30 minutes, you've been looking out the window, you've been looking up the ceiling, and I know you haven't paid a bit of attention, but this one thing, if you haven't heard anything else, and usually when you say that, man, they'll start looking at you, and for that next two or three seconds, you add their attention to say, if you don't learn anything, learn this, Okay? And so, uh, and so I do that all the time, and it works very well with teenagers, okay? 
And so if you, if you haven't listened, this is it. Uh, I, I, I got kind of tickled uh, in Sunday school a couple of weeks ago. I did this. I have sixth through eighth graders in Sunday school. And we've been going through the book of Genesis. And we're in Genesis chapter number three. Uh, talking about it. I'm doing my own lessons and uh, uh, we were talking about sin and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And, and so uh, the lesson was what I was trying to teach them. I've been breaking that chapter up in several parts, you know, just in little pieces. And so what we, the, the, the thing that we were trying to learn that morning was when we sin, it's always by choice. It's never by accident. We never sin by accident. It's always by choice. We choose to sin. And so here's how I got their attention and they remembered it from week to week, and they'll tell you this week uh, what it was and, and what was the theme of the lesson. And here's what I did. Of course, we know, uh, everybody knows Romeo and Juliet, to be or not to be, or, or Shakespeare, whatever that is. But my, my question was, I said, to sin or not to sin, that is the question. To sin or not to sin, that is the, and I kept saying that, and they remember that. But that was the theme. That was try. You know, they may not pay attention to the rest of it, but they could tell you that we were talking about sin is not an accident. So sin or not to sin, that is the question. And so that well, you kind of use things like that that gets their attention. But here's the point in number four: it helps them to easily learn one unmistakable truth. And so if they didn't listen to any of the rest of the lesson, but they did learn that one thing: that sin is a conscious choice that we always choose to do right or wrong. We always have a choice in the matter. The devil didn't make Adam and Eve sin. Adam didn't make Eve sin. Eve didn't make Adam sin. They tried to blame each other. That's what we talked about last week. But the, the reality was they made a conscious choice. And so if they remember that phrase, they got the truth that I was trying to impart, okay? And so that's what it's talking about here. The average student retains very little, but we can make sure... That, that what they do remember is significant. So understand that, that they're not going to remember everything. I've, I've taught a lot of adults, they don't remember a whole lot of some of the stuff that you've tried to impart to them, but that's okay. But you give them a little bit. If you've learned a little, and I've said this, school of the Bible is overwhelming. What you're taking is actually a Bible college class, okay? You're, if you would go to Bible college at Crown College, these would be some of the same classes. Uh, you, they would be probably much more professional and much more, uh, 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 you'd have homework and those things there. But the way the school of the Bible is, this is actually Bible college material. And so sometimes you come in here, and, and I've seen adults get nervous and they get overloaded because, man, all of this information tonight, we've talked about the Christian home and we're talking about teaching the Bible and we've tried to keep up with you going through the book of Romans, there's just so much stuff. But I give you the notes because my goal and Pastor Marvin's goal I know is, and we've been teaching this a few years now, our goal is if you come and you learn one thing, it, it, and our goal is to use this as a tool to, to strengthen our church and our people to give you a Bible knowledge. But if you come, and, and yes, we've backed up a dump truck load of Bible knowledge and we've poured it out there on you and you feel smothered and covered up, but if you learn one thing new, it's been a success. It's been because that's helped you to grow in the Lord. Just one thing. We're putting it all out there, and so that's the goal, okay? So let's look at the next page. Got to move on here. Methods of developing a central theme. Okay, so how do we, all right, we need to have a central theme, so how do we do that? All right, let's look at some of these. Number one, the central theme in a didactic passage of Scripture exposition. Who in the world can interpret that? The central theme in a didactic passage of Scripture or exposition. Well, the word didactic, it just means instructive, okay? So let's look at, uh, there's different passages in the Bible. They, 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 they show different things, but let's look at an instructive passage in the Bible, okay? And so a lot of, a lot of what we're talking about, uh, uh, we're talking about the book of Romans tonight, for an example. It's doctrinal issues. It's a didactic. We read Romans chapter 3 talking about propitiation and redemption. That's instruction. Paul is teaching by instruction. And so by definition, that is a didactic passage. And when you hear, uh, it's, it's talking about instruction. So how do we pull a theme out of that? Okay. Well, a lot of times, uh, and Pastor Marvin does this a, a whole lot, uh, uh, but he, he uses expository preaching. He, he does verse by verse, exposition. We're going to go verse by verse, word by word, down through it. It's a wonderful way to teach and preach and learn the Bible. And so this is what it's kind of talk about, an exposition. So letter A, we read the passage through in one setting several times, write down the general topic being addressed. So these passages you have for homework, 
Just sit down and read them once or twice, look at them, and then try to write down a general topic that, that, that you think that's being talked about. Letter B, break the passage into natural parts and summarize each division in your own words. Letter C, look for repeated words or phrases. For instance, tonight in the passage uh, that we read in John 4, he's talking about sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping, sowing and... Uh, you, you get that just automatically, and so pull that out, okay? Letter D, find a common denominator in the text. I don't like that word denominator, it means fractions. Maggie's been having fractions of math, and it, my, my brain is about to explode these last few weeks. But we're talking about not math denominator, but we're talking about a text. The common underlying theme. So uh, from our passage we read tonight, what was the common denominator? What was the central theme? Soul winning, winning heart, sowing and reaping, winning souls, okay? It's a truth, a command, or a principle woven throughout, okay? And so what we read in Romans chapter 3, what would you think was uh, the theme there Paul was trying to convey to us? That salvation is not by the... Righteousness is not by the law, right, but by faith in Christ. And then all of that that he talks about. And then rewrite the sentence, making it as concise and clear as possible. So you're just, you're just fine-tuning as you read. You pull out a general thought and you think about it. You know, don't... This, this isn't rocket science, okay, so you don't have to over... <laughs> so I, I got point A checked off, point B. Just look at it, pull the thought out. What you get out of it, build you an outline around it. And think, okay, these, okay, I've got this amount of time, X amount of time. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be like Pastor JP and go over. I'm going to try to stay in my time limit. And these are the thoughts that I want to convey to my young people, the students, whoever I'm teaching, all right? Number two. Okay, now that was uh, uh, in a didactic. So how many of you before tonight has ever even heard the word didactic before? I hadn't until I even taught this class. All right, some of you may have. But that means instructive, okay? So you learned something tonight already. My, my goal is accomplished. You find out what a didactic passage of Scripture is. An instructive passage of Scripture. Okay, what about number two? What about this finding the central theme in a, in a passage of poetry in Scripture? What were, what were some of the poetical books we studied? Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Right? And so these were the poetical books, okay? So, okay, we talked about how to do it in an instructive passage. What about a poetical, uh, uh, like Psalms or Proverbs? Well, letter A, in some poetical passages, the central theme will be delivered in exactly the same way as a didactic passage, okay? Psalms 23, right off the top of your head, what's the central theme of Psalms 23? The verse verse says it. The Lord is my shepherd, okay? And so from around that... That, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's where it would be similar to the instructive passage, okay? But, uh, but look here, letter uh, B. Look for contrasts which center on a common theme. Example, hate and love, fear and hope, trouble and deliverance, silence and praise. You find these throughout the Psalms. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is full, absolutely full of comparisons and, and, and contrast. Contrast and comparison, good and evil. Just and unjust, okay? Wicked and the godly. All through it. Uh, Proverbs is plumb full of that, okay? And so find the contrast. Talk about that. And uh, we went through the book of Proverbs with our teenagers for a while, and we did that. Uh, looking at the, uh, you know, I, I remember one of them, we was talking about uh, what the Bible said about a friend's. Is, uh, is having the right kind of friend and being the right kind of friend, but the right kind and the wrong kind. And so the Proverbs tells us the right kind of friends and the wrong kind of friends. And so uh, there's contrast there. Make that your theme. Then letter C, state the central theme in such a way that it relates not only to the writer of the psalm, but also to our lives. Okay, so Solomon's writing this to his son, but how does this apply to you and I? Okay, uh, the same principle applies to us. So pull that Bible truth that Bible principle out, same way. And then number three, the central theme in a narrative portion of Scripture. So we talked about an instructive or a didactic passage of Scripture and then how to pull it out of a poetic passage of Scripture. But what about a narrative or where there's stories or uh, historical accounts that are being given? Well, number A or letter A, gain a full understanding of the historical account given, okay? And so understand uh, what's going on in the background. Uh, what's happening, write down the general topic being addressed, 
Okay, you could talk about, uh, you know, when it talks about the narrative of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and uh, just any historical event, the Bible is full of them, narrative passages uh, of Scripture talking about uh, things that are happening. And so just pull that thought, same way out. Letter B, write down the general topic being addressed. C, determine the central truth thought, uh, taught through the story as a whole. So what would the, the central truth around God bringing uh, the... Uh, uh, the account we have in Exodus of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, what's the, what is really the one main focus and idea that we find? God is delivering or redeeming his people. He's bringing them out by the blood of the Lamb and saving them. So, so that whole narrative is really is built and established on that one principle. Okay? And then letter D, write a central theme and use this to govern your approach and, and present the story. So really, it doesn't matter what portion of the Bible you're looking at. It's really... You're just looking for that central theme that you're trying to convey to your students. All right, concluding remarks, and we'll be done for the night. All right, you need to discern the central theme early in your study before developing other ideas which may not be related. And what you'll find out when you... You might start studying one thing, and God takes you in a different direction. And He might take you in five different directions. But you follow the Lord and stick with Him because you'll wind up when you start, you've got a message this big. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta trim the fat off of it. You gotta, you gotta get it down to get to the lean, to get to the meat. What you gotta give to the people or give your students, okay? And so do that. Number two, if one of your students were asked, "What did the teacher say?" They should answer by giving the central theme of your lesson. And so I hope that uh, a few Sundays ago, and some of my kids tell me that, their parents were asking what they learned in Sunday school. And, and they told me, I know uh, one little girl in particular, she said, uh, she said I, I told them what we studied about today, to sin or not to sin, that is the question. And so they understood that central truth. And uh, they may not have got anything else, but they understood that. They're a good group of kids. They were listening. Okay, so keep it simple, repeat, be clear. And so your assignment is to take, on page uh, 18 there, uh, take those uh, uh, remaining passages of Scripture next week, and we'll just go over them. No right or wrong answer. Just go over them. Reminder, uh, the next two weeks, uh, we're going to be meeting on Thursday. Okay, so next two weeks, we're going to have School of the Bible on Thursday, on March 11th and March 18th, due to our missions conference, and uh, we have a school board meeting next week. So, so be back with us. We'll be here on Thursday. Well, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you for those who are here, and I will close in prayer and get you out of here for the night. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this class, and Father, we thank you, Lord, that we've studied uh, these wonderful doctrinal truths tonight from the book of Romans, and Lord, that our salvation is by grace through faith, and Lord, that we've been redeemed, and all these wonderful things. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction. We